Oh, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the Philosophy Podcast. I'm going to be talking about free will and time today. And I um, hope you're going to be interested in this subject. We all like to think we've got free will. Um, a lot of philosophers will tell you that that belief is probably incorrect um, but I would argue that their reasoning for that isn't adequate, isn't correct and in fact a common sense view of free will is probably more correct. So I hope you'll enjoy this and uh, I think we'll, we can cover it in about 10 minutes. So the first thing to consider about free will is what else could you have other than free will so what else could you have is often called determinism basically that's the idea that everything that happens in the world has a cause that cause is also in the world and we know how cause and effects works in the world we know all the way back to the original cause, probably, as far as science tells us, is the Big Bang. And at that point, everything else that happens in the universe is fixed. In other words, way before we are born, before we start making decisions, all the causes that will lead to those decisions have been fixed and therefore if you had an adequate understanding of physics which we don't but you know your physicists assume we will do um, you could you could look at all these causes you could look at how they affect us you know how our genes affect us how our upbringing affects us how our environment generally affects us and if you could look at all of the causes and you understood all the rules, then you could predict that I would lift up my hand right now and make a duck shape and go quack, 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 and then go woof, woof, woof. Okay? So that's determinism, that's the, the, main, the main competing theory, let's say, against the idea of free will. Now, there's a couple of consequences of that. One of those consequences is that we have the illusion of free will. So, for some reason, evolution has given us the illusion of free will, even though we don't have it. So, and the explanation for that is that we need to have that illusion to feel like we are active agents in the world and not just um, passive predetermined machines for some emotional reason um, so that's that's their explanation for why we think we have free will given determinism it's true now modern science has shown that Determinism itself is a little bit implausible in that it's not actually possible to predict a, the state of the universe knowing all the state at point A to be able to predict what the state will be at point B. And it's partly because of quantum physics where what we eat we can't actually tell exactly what the outcome of a quantum event will be. What we can tell is a certain probability. Um, and for all practical purposes, in general, with larger collections of quantum particles, which is what human beings are and what everything is, um, we can predict within a fairly good range for practical purposes, we can predict what will happen. So in that sense, determinism is true, but 
in a in a broader sense, a deep at a deep level, determinism is not true. And in fact, even for big objects like human beings and planets and things like that, there is a tiny fraction of a chance that we wouldn't be able to predict what they would do. And the smaller and smaller the object is, or the collection of objects is, the less and less sure we can be exactly what will happen. Now obviously the human brain has a lot of small elements to it that are active, we know. You know, neurons are quite small. They're still pretty big in quantum terms. But they have some elements that people like Roger Penrose and others have shown may be small enough to be subject to quantum effects. And therefore, our own brains may themselves not be very determined at all at some levels. They may be quite indeterminate, quite random. So here we come to another argument against free will. And it's quite a clever one, but it's wrong. I think I can show you why. So the argument goes, well, OK, maybe determinism isn't 100% true. Um, and certainly at the small level, the evidence shows that it's indeterministic. And so maybe our brain is. The problem with that is, well, OK, if it's indeterministic, then it's random. And therefore, um, this also isn't free will, because it just means that we're either determined, which gives us sort of goal-directed action, even if the goals aren't our own, perhaps, um, or it's indeterministic, the other extreme, in which case um, we, we are acting at random. And so we're not really choosing because we just come up with random choices in that way. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, why do we have to just choose between these extremes? And we don't. And in fact, again, quantum physics shows us that this isn't the case. Yes, it is indeterministic, ultimately, but within a certain range, in general. So for practical purposes, you know, we know that it's going to work a lot of the time. For instance, a cell phone doesn't work all the time, does it? But it works most of the time. And the, the signalling protocol that cell phones use take, a, take allowance of the fact that sometimes this, the random nature of quantum fluctuations doesn't actually work out the way you want it to or predict it to. And so there's a fail safe so that it will you know, make sure that the message has got through. Um, we're talking a digital number here, there's ones and zeros, so there are protocols by which you can check those ones and zeros have come through correctly. If they haven't, they just get resent. This all happens very quickly. So there's ways to correct for certain random elements in a system. And especially one where the probability isn't completely random it's it's more like a prob probability curve in general you know roughly where it's going to be there's going to be outliers on that curve if you can imagine a curve like a bell-shaped curve right out here there's going to be some very unusual events but in general everything most things are going to be in this area so this all works for practical purposes and works in the brain as well uh, and so now we come on to where I stand on this issue um, on free will I certainly believe it's true um, and I would say I'm coming from a point of view where I choose to believe it's true so 
I'm not claiming that I'm objective, but then nobody is <laughs> on this subject. And I'm going to go into why people might want to believe that free will isn't true. And that might surprise you that someone would want to believe that, but clearly some people do, because it's not very plausible to the arguments against free will. So you've got to ask yourself why people accept them quite readily, often. So, so right, well, what is really happening? Well, in my opinion, in the brain, you have elements that are more or less deterministic. Let's say they're predictable 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah, so these are big systems, big circuits with a lot of checking going on and a lot of um, parallel processes to make sure it's all working properly. Yeah, when we're talking about the brain, we're talking about a very, very complex set of structure, set, set of um, structures. So all, it's all very possible that that kind of thing is in the brain. Some very, very amazing technology. Um, there's as many connections in the brain as there are probably grains of sand in the universe. <laughs> so you're talking about enormous complexity. This is a mind-boggling complexity. So the brain's perfectly capable of having that kind of hardware that's very, very robust, um, very parallel and very reliable. But it's also got some small structures and we know the brain is that complex that in some ways it's so complex it can, it can be a bit unreliable. We can't, we can, certain tasks that the brain does worse than, you know, an abacus. And that's why we use an abacus or a calculator to help our brain do certain tasks. And the reason that the brain is not as good at those tasks as a simple machine might be is not because it doesn't have as much complex complexity or ability. It's because it's so complex and so able and it's not really designed to do that kind of simple task of adding eight numbers together, big numbers together. Yeah. It's not been designed to do that. If it was, it, and that you know, we could do that instantly. And there are some people who can do that. Um, there are savants, um, people with autistic spectrum disorders, like autism or Asperger's syndrome, who can indeed add up numbers just like a calculator. We know the brain can, in principle, do these things quite easily, but in general, our brains are not set up for that. They're set up for something a lot more complex and um, a lot more useful in general life. And um, so the brain has these computer-like qualities and it also has some very small structures that are probably, most likely, fairly random. And when I say fairly random, I'm talking about on the probability curve, a lot of their output are right out at the edges here. Yeah, so one in a million, one in a thousand, you could predict it, yeah. But the brain manages to bring both, the power of both of these together to create decisions and this is where free will comes from because it uses the predictability of the computer side to assess the output 
from the more random side and sort through the random output for useful information, useful directions. And so what you have is a machine essentially that can generate random solutions to problems and then choose between them very rapidly the ones that are most likely to achieve what has been decided to be achieved or the goals of the organism, the goals of the person. And it is that actual choosing that we call free will. So what we have is the best of both worlds. We have the freedom of the random, i.e. the potential solutions we can come up with are not limited by anything. And we call this creativity. But really creativity is random stuff that's been filtered through the rational or more rational side more predictable side of our brains <clears throat> and this is why in general people who consider a particular issue over and over again and work on a particular issue tend to come up with more ideas in relation to that issue simply because they're pushing that structure to keep coming up with new ideas they're coming up with random ideas and they're sorting through them Okay, so this is how free will works, and really, when you think about it, it's all pretty common sense. It's not really that complicated. So why don't people, or why don't a lot of philosophers believe this? Well, that's a good question. For a start, they would say, well, there's no proof that that the brain can generate random signals like I've been describing yep if they say that they're flying in the face of a lot of science um, and you know they philosophers really shouldn't be doing that we're, we're not scientists we shouldn't be discounting scientists findings because they're inconvenient for our theories uh, Roger Penrose is a good example of a very great physicist who is quite happy to say that the, the neurons can generate indeterminist information. Um, we, we, science has come to the point now where they, they can even find that certain larger um, systems do even have randomness do even have indeterminism um, so I think that debate is really over and it seems like a lot of philosophers still need to catch up with that so and the other one is they say well in that case it's just random well this is a very bizarre position to take because what you're saying is well okay human beings are just random then but we're not just random um, we are obviously not just running around like headless chickens all the time certainly you can say that there's an awful lot of irrationality and strangeness in the world but there again I mean if I want a pint of milk I go to the supermarket and buy a pint of milk. I don't uh, bang my head against the wall thinking that's going to get me a pint of milk. So, <coughs> yeah, we certainly, you know, it's, it's reasonable to say we have elements of randomness, but to say because of that we're completely random is just very hard for me to see much. value in that proposition. Um, here I am using a, 
a highly complex digital camera which I'm going to upload to a computer network and you're going to use a computer that's been manufactured in a factory transported around the world all sorts of regulations and other things to say that's all come about just at random is very strange <laughs> to say the least no, human beings are not that random we've got elements of randomness we've got elements of irrationality um, but and even madness but we've also got plenty of goal-directed, sensible, rational elements as well. So that doesn't even slightly help water. So then really what we've got to ask ourselves is why would someone believe such a implausible thing like human beings are random? What would be their motivation? Well, presumably it's because they want to believe that free will isn't true. And so why would they want to believe that? Well, I would say because it lets them off the hook. It, it means that they're not responsible for their actions. The universe is responsible. The Big Bang is responsible. So, the great payoff of not believing in free will is that this sense of responsibility coming off your shoulders, you know. Oh, now, I'm not saying that they've done anything terrible. I'm sure most of them haven't. But just that wonderful relief that, oh, I don't have to worry anymore. I don't really have to try anymore. It's just, I can just let things happen. And I think that's worrying. I think that's, personally, for me, I, I prefer to believe in free will. I want to explain why that is. Because, for a start, it may not be real. I, I don't say that I've proved that it's real, with what I've said here. Mostly I've disproved those... I would say I've disproved those who think that they have proved free will isn't real. So it's a complicated way of saying that I've just knocked down their arguments. Um, so it's still possible it isn't real. And um, it may be a debate that's open for a very long time. We may... I think we will want to probably understand it, how it works. I don't think it's that complicated. But I think it's better, to, even if it's not real, and this is sort of like a Pascal's wager kind of argument, even if it's not real, free will is an illusion, I think you're better off believing it isn't an illusion. Because at least you will have more motivation to um, try to change things about your world. And whether ultimately free will is real or not, we certainly can affect our lives. We certainly can affect our world by our actions, by our attitudes, by our thoughts. Now, whether that ultimately we can do anything original without being influenced by prior causes. Okay, let's leave that open for now. I think we can. But my argument is a practical and psychological one that maybe we're better off believing it, even if it's not true. Because what are the consequences of believing it's true when it's not? It's hard for me to see any bad consequence there. But what are the consequences of believing it's untrue when it is true? Now I can see some pretty bad consequences in that we may be less likely to take responsibility for our actions. 